You probably know the Buddha story of the man shot with the arrow. His friends and relatives take him to the doctor, and as the doctor is about to remove the arrow, the man says, no, wait a minute, I've got to know who made this arrow, who shot this arrow, what it was made of, what feathers it was made of, what kind of wood it was made of, before I let you take it out. As the Buddha said, of course, the man will die before the arrow was removed. He told this story to a monk who had come to him and said, Look, I'm not going to practice until you tell me whether the world is eternal or not, finite or infinite, whether the soul is the same thing as a body or different from the body, whether an awakened person after death exists or doesn't exist or both or neither. Issues that nowadays a lot of us don't really pay much attention to. But we do tend to have our issues coming to the practice, and so it's good to remember that when you come to the practice you've got to put your issues aside, personal issues, social issues, because there is this problem of suffering happening right here, right now. And as those chants we had just now reminded us, aging, illness, and death are normal. The illness and death can come at any time. You don't know how much time you have to practice. So when you know that you do have the time, you give it your full attention. It's a quality in Pali that's called jitta. You really want to be intent on what you're doing. You don't want to leave anything left over. You don't want to hold anything back. So right here, right now, you want to give all your attention to the breath. Remembering that the breath is not just the air coming in and out of the lungs, but it's the flow of energy in the body. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that the energy flow has many levels of subtlety and can be felt anywhere in the body. There's a simple background buzz of energy that lets you know that where the different parts of your body are. And then as you breathe in and breathe out, you'll notice there's a kind of movement, and the movement happens at different speeds. There's one very subtle level of breath energy that as soon as you start breathing in, it's gone all the way through your nervous system. Another more blatant level of energy flows more slowly through the nerves along the blood vessels. And you begin to notice, after a while, that you have a tendency when you breathe in to pull the energy up or pull the energy down. Or when you breathe out, you squeeze the energy out. And you might want to ask yourself, is that the best way to manipulate the energy? We don't think we're manipulating it, but it's something we've learned so thoroughly and done so consistently that it just falls into the background. It becomes a subconscious process. And so one way of bringing it back into consciousness is to ask yourself that question, what direction does the energy go when you breathe in? Does the energy in the body feel coordinated, or does one part seem to be fighting against another part? Centuries ago there was a Japanese master, Hakuin, who suffered from what he called Zen sickness. And you read his description of it, and it was basically the problem where he as he was breathing and he was pulling the energy up into his head. He learned the treatment for it was to imagine that you had a big ball of butter on your head and it was melting and basically bringing the energy down, 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 down your shoulders, down your back, through your hips, down your legs, down to your feet. That's one problem that can develop if you're not really paying attention to how the energy is going in the body as you sit here. Because if you have an unhealthy habit, then trying to focus on the breath, you will force that habit onto the breathing process. And if you stick with it long enough, it's going to be bad for you. So this is why the Buddha talks about getting the mind into a state of concentration and developing a sense of ease, and then allowing that ease, a sense of ease and fullness to spread throughout the body. 
his image is of a bathman or a bathman's apprentice mixing a lump of bath powder. Back in those days they didn't have soap. They would take a kind of bath powder and they would mix it with water until they had what was very much like a dough, like when we make bread. And you'd mix it with water and then you'd rub it all over your body. In the same way as when you're mixing the, the bath powder with the water, so you, you want to get it so that the whole lump of bath powder has been moistened, and yet there's not water dripping out. In the same way, you want that sense of ease and pleasure to fill the whole body. The best way to do that is to find one spot in the body, a very sensitive spot. And John Lee talks about the bases of the breath, which correspond pretty closely to what the Indians call chakras. These are the sensitive energy centers in the body. You can find one that feels congenial to you, and one where you'll notice if you're putting undue pressure on the breath, either with the in-breath or the out, and try to maintain a sense of ease and just rightness there at that spot, all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. And you find to do this, you've got to relax tension in different parts of your body. This is why this is called a center of breath energy, because it's connected with a lot of other energy channels, energy flows in the different parts of the body. So if you can keep this one open and relaxed, you'll find that it has an influence in different parts of the body automatically. And then you think of it spreading from there to other parts as well. If you find that there's some areas where the energy doesn't spread, you go to those spots, focus there, and see if you can loosen things up. Again, keep in mind that as you breathe in, you're gonna, not going to allow any tension to build up in those spots, and as you breathe out, you're not going to squeeze things out or hold on to tension. Just keep things open and relaxed all the way in, all the way out. And when you've made a survey of the body, everything seems okay, go back to your center spot and then think of spreading that sense of ease again. This requires balance. On the one hand, you've got your one point that you're focused on, but at the same time you also have a larger frame of reference, the body as a whole, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes. And you sometimes find that you're more in the one-pointed mode and you're more in the or more in the full body mode. But ideally you want to have both going. And that requires a lot of attention. This is why we say you have to give it your full attention. Because when everything is really balanced like this, it helps prevent the mind from wandering off. It helps prevent you from going on automatic pilot with the breath just comes in and goes out, and you've kind of left it there so that you can go pay attention to something else. You want to give this your full attention. And immediately the mind will say, well, how long do I stay here? You stay here as long as you can. This is an important skill. We've read so much about how Vipassana is superior to Samatha, that it's skewed everybody's practice. For one thing, the Buddha never taught these as separate techniques of meditation. There are two qualities of mind that you bring to the meditation, regardless of what meditation you're doing. And you do want to bring the mind to stillness. The whole purpose of both the tranquility and the insight is to induce more and more stillness. The insight is there to try to ferret out where the disturbances are that, one, prevents you from getting into concentration, and two, prevent the concentration from deepening. And then three, get you stuck on the concentration so you can't gain the kind of insight that really cuts through the defilements. But even that, cutting through the defilements is with the purpose of bringing the mind to absolute stillness. So the insight and the tranquility have to go together. When the Buddha talked about full awakening, he said it's both awareness release and discernment release. Awareness release is the release from passion that comes from getting the mind into really strong concentration. Discernment release is 
the release from ignorance. That comes when your insight and discernment are really sharp. You need both. And you work on both together. Sometimes you'll be emphasizing one side and sometimes you'll be emphasizing the other. But the important thing is that you remember, both have to go together. The Buddha has another image of a fortress. The wall of the fortress is discernment. It's a slippery wall so that enemies can't get in, climb, can't climb up the wall to get in the fortress. But if you just have that slippery wall but you don't have any food, the soldiers in your fortress are going to die. Concentration is the food. You need both in order to stay safely in the fortress. And as you fully inhabit this fortress of the body, if your awareness really does fill the body, there's another image the Buddha has. He said it's like a solid door of hardwood. Trying to throw a ball of string into the door. It won't go into the door. It just bounces right off the door. But if your awareness doesn't fill the body, he said it's like a lump of wet clay. You're trying to throw a stone into it, the stone goes right into the clay. And those other things can start invading your body. Little thought worlds can develop. Have you ever noticed the fact that when a thought world appears in the mind, there's also going to be a pattern of tension someplace in the body. And that part of the body tends to get obscured. But if you're fully inhabiting the body and staying on the level of the body, those thought worlds don't have any niches that they can sneak into, no place where they can take hold. At the same time, you find that you're not picking up energy from other people. As you fully inhabit the body, it's like an energy field develops around the body to protect you from other people's negative energy. So these are some of the advantages that come from being fully aware, <coughs> fully aware of the whole body. Just fully in space and fully in time, i.e. continually, without any gaps. So this quality of jitta, intentness, is something you want to bring as consistently as possible to your practice. And other issues that you may be carrying around, you want to leave them at the door. Because the big issue in life is the quality of the mind. And if you let it get eaten up by things that are Pressing but not important. They yell and scream for attention and make you miss the point that we don't stay here forever. Aging, illness, and death can happen at any time. Those chants we had on aging, illness, and death, and also the chant on the world is swept away, it is not enduring, offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. It's not negativity for the sake of negativity. It's just a statement of fact to remind you, okay, you've got to be heedful. Death could come at any time. Illness can come at any time. That earthquake that they keep warning us about could hit at any time. Other things could happen as well. The body doesn't have any contracts that it signs saying that it's going to give you as much time as you like, or it's going to give you any fair warning before things start to break down. It just does its own thing. There are lots of ways that sudden and unexpected death can happen, and you want your mind to be prepared. So you don't have to suffer through aging. You don't have to suffer through illness. You don't have to suffer through death. Things may happen. These things will happen, of course. But when the mind is trained, it doesn't have to suffer. And the mind just doesn't naturally develop good qualities. When the Buddha talked about the basis for skillfulness, the basis for 
developing good qualities of the mind. He said, it's not that it, there's an innate goodness there that you're trying to uncover. The mind has both good qualities and not so good qualities. And the only way the good ones are going to get developed if you, is if you develop a strong sense of heedfulness, realizing that your actions do make a difference and you've got to be careful and you've got to get to work as soon as possible because you don't know how much time you have. That's the attitude that's going to bring you true happiness. It's not warm and fuzzy, but it's very practical. And those teachings are there as kind of a fence. So if you find your attention wandering from the breath back to other distractions, bang, you run into aging, bang, you run into illness, bang, you run into death, so you come right back. These teachings have you surrounded, as long as you keep them in mind. If you don't keep them in mind, it's like a big hole in your fence. Other things can come in, you can go slipping out. Whatever food of concentration you have inside the fence gets stolen away. So you've got to be careful. Try to be as fully mindful and as fully alert as you can all around, and as consistently mindful and consistently alert all through time. Don't let there be any gaps. It's only when you give it your full attention that you can get the full results.